Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, like my title. I, I think it's actually pretty cool. I don't like all my titles, but I, I sort of like this one. And I told Annie when, when because I sometimes give her some very challenging uh, sermon titles to give a cover design for. And I said, this is just sort of manly. You can get some mud spl splattered on the face of some guy. And this is what she came back with. And I think, you know, she took me literally on that one. So uh, I like that. Uh, and it's a good Father's Day theme. You see, playing the man, it's, it's not necessarily just a manhood message. And I have to say this every time I whip out a manhood message. You see, when we're saying play the man, we're actually, the man is Jesus. It's not just masculinity, it's Jesus. And Jesus expresses himself through a man's skin uniquely, and it's somewhat different than how he expresses it through female skin. But it is still the same Jesus, and it is a profound picture of the kingdom of heaven. Second Samuel 10, 12, uh, I, I just, this is just a great statement. Uh, it's in the midst of a battle with the Syrians and Joab, commander of the armed forces of Israel, says to his men, be of good courage and let us play the men for our people. Yeah, I just like that. I just think that's great. And for the cities of our God and the, and the Lord do that which seems him good. So this idea of playing the man, I, I've dealt with this for so many years here at Ellerslie to try and define this unique quality. In a gender-confused culture, it's always a little strange to be talking about manhood and femininity as if it's so obvious that there's only two genders, right? It's like, Eric, are you allowed to do that? When I was growing up, it was always just two genders. It wasn't even an issue. And so now it's like, you know, this, you feel a little heat uh, as, as you start talking about it as a, as a preacher. But uh, there, there's a quality that God has given a man, a responsibility that God has given a man. So when Joab is saying, let's play the men, what does he mean by that? It's, it's always been known throughout history that a man has a certain responsibility, a certain wiring. He is given a job to do. And so the illustration I always gave to my kids uh, when they were young was, imagine the big meanie, we called the devil the big meanie, came to the looty door and went, kunk, 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 hey, I want to come in and I want to hurt someone. As, a, as the man of the home, what is my response? Do I run into the basement and yell at my wife, honey, could you take care of that? Uh, do I hide behind my wife and shove her to the door and say, honey, could you talk to whoever this is and I'll be, just, I'll be supporting you? And even as I say that, everything about you knows that there's something wrong about that. For me to go and hide and put the job on my, how, uh, you know, I give the job to Lily, my daughter, and say, Lily, could you deal with this? Daddy's going to go hide. Everything about that violates a wiring, a framework that we intrinsically inherently know, and that is that a man is responsible to take the hit. A man is responsible, even if his knees are knocking, to greet the bad guy and to say, honey, take the kids into the basement, hide, and don't come out until I tell you. And even though the man might have his knees literally clattering together, it is something that we as men are built to do. And of course, that goes all the way back to the cross. Look at the man. The man says, I will take this upon myself. And he does. He bears the burden. He carries the, the weight of that cross that we, of course, should have carried. But because he is a good if we could say it this way, man, he is going to carry it for us, for his bride. He doesn't shove his bride in front and say, I'll hide back here. And so playing the man. So I, I, this term, I use it a lot. Pulling, I don't use pulling a lootie a lot, but pulling a something. Like this week, we talked about pulling a Brian, okay? And to, for the students, we know what that means. And for the rest of you just looking in, you're like, what in the world, pulling a Brian? How do you do that? Well, it's, it's sort of, usually it's a, it's a personal phrase that comes out, and it's usually amongst a small group of people where one guy really blows it or does something funny, and then everyone wants to bring it up uh, consistently, and that's probably why I use it a lot, right? Because in our church, for instance, we have a, a pulling, is it pulling a Brent or pulling a, a Cooper? I don't know, which, which one is it, Brent? Is it pulling a Brent? Pulling a Brent. And uh, that means to hold the microphone at the bottom where the, it ke keeps cutting out. Uh, so that's right. He did it like once, but that's all we needed. We just needed one time, and then we could start calling it pulling a Brent. So I had just arrived. I was a freshman in uh, college. I was on the soccer team, and I had a breakaway. 
And you know, when you're the freshman, this is a really good team with multiple All-Americans on it. I'm the freshman, and I'm just trying to make the cut. Okay, this is a huge deal, a lot of pressure on me. And I get the breakaway ball. Goalie, who is an All-American goalie, and freshman Eric going toe-to-toe, head-to-head, and I'm running full speed. And, you know, goalies where I came from, you know, they were goalies. They stood in the goalie box. This guy was not a goalie. This guy was an animal. (laughs) And he comes racing out after me, yelling, screaming at the top of his lungs, "Ah!" and I, yeah, I didn't play the man. I'll just say it that way. And so I shot the ball way too early, and I chipped. I was just, I, I wasn't doing well, okay, guys? It's just like I blew it. And the ball went sailing over the goal. When you have a one-on-one with a goalie, you have to make it. There is just no excuse uh, for missing it. And I didn't just miss it. It went sailing 10 feet over the goal. Okay, so the rest of the season, it was known as pulling a looty. Oh, boy. Uh, So in this particular message, I'm going to start with the idea of pulling a Jonathan. Now, I have used the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer multiple times over the years. First of all, I think it's one of the most amazing stories to depict so many different aspects of faith. But that's pulling a Jonathan, and and I'll go into that story in just a bit. And, you know, one of the things I have on the screen for the the students, because I'm going to dig into this a little, is this idea of pulling a Brian. Sorry, Brian, to whip you. I probably should have gotten your approval ahead of time. But if you don't give it to me, I'll just say, I'm talking about a different Brian. You know, how, how does he know I was talking about him? But uh, pulling a Brian, so Brian's one of our students from this semester, and he was an illustration this week. And that illustration is going to play into our message today as well. So the backdrop to our story, if we're going to talk about pulling a Jonathan uh, first, uh, here it is, 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 7, Philistines versus the Israelites. The Israelites are in one of those places where, you know, bad leadership leads you. And here's what I could say. When the flesh begins to take over your life, there's there's a breakdown. There always will be. And in God's economy, that's the way it is. Saul has not been a good leader. You know, he he has all the raw materials to be a good leader. And that's why the, the people of Israel wanted him. He's head and shoulders above all Israelites. That means he was Israel's giant. He's like the guy you want at the head. And yet, he hasn't done a good job of leading. And the result is something like this. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. Listen to these numbers. 30,000 chariots. That is a lot of chariots. I, you know, I always look back at that and I'm like, not, not just 30,000 men. It's 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. Okay, I don't know if you're starting to get a little nervous if you're an Israelite. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Okay, now, if you understood what was going on with Israel, you'd understand why they're they're trembling. Okay, so let's see if we can remember our numbers. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people like the, you know, and soldiers like the sands of the sea. You know, it's like numberless. Okay, that, that doesn't, that's not a good start. And you're already seeing the response of Israel. Now, we just walked through a very odd season in American history. I would like to think it was an aberration and a blip. And then we all regain our sanity and we, you know, get back to whatever we call normal. Have you ever noticed that even what was normal before uh, COVID-19 wasn't very healthy, just as a reminder? I know we're even more unhealthy now, but we've been headed in the wrong direction for a long time. And when there is an encroachment of evil, it boasts, it clatters its swords loudly, it has loud noises that it makes, rumbling noises, and it's supposed to terrify you. Part of war is before the war begins, and it is to try and intimidate the opponent. And different... uh, Different armies throughout the ages have had different techniques. And uh, those techniques have a very, very simple purpose, and that is to melt your heart, to actually cause you to lose all confidence and to want to run even before you engage with the enemy. Okay, our enemy, the devil, and his great horde function off the same evil principle. It's called fear. 
it's called the principle of cowardice inside of us. You see, if he can make us play the coward instead of the man, then we will not even be there on the day to fight. And so that's just going to lay a little foundation for you because there has been a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety that has made its way into our culture that is far beyond what was in our culture before mid-March of 2020. When fear became hip and cool in our culture, which is what it became, it was like cool if you were fearful of COVID-19. And if you weren't fearful, you were part of the problem. I don't know if you guys remember that dynamic. It was weird. To the point where if, if you're like nonchalant about COVID-19, you're the problem. You need to be fearful of this. It's like, why do I need to be fearful? I'm not fearful of anything. Haven't you read the Bible? The Bible says, do not fear. But you better fear this. Otherwise, you're arch enemy number one of our culture. That's a weird thing. When a culture like America that has always, always given plaudits to the fearless, always, our history is based on raising the fist of the fearless in the air and saying, look at what this person has done. Suddenly, we flipped roles. Now, unless you are the fearful, you know, you're not part of the in crowd. And the fearless were now the problem. That is a weird world to live in. And yet, welcome to new America. And so, as a result, fear has become a household good, a common thing. Everyone has a phone, well, everyone has fear now too. And so it has become so commonplace that we as the church sometimes don't recognize the enemy's encroachment. It is so normal now in our lives. It ought not to be that way. Signs of imminent defeat. So remember our big list of numbers for the uh, Philistines? Uh, let's start building uh, the reason why the Israelites might be fearful. 1 Samuel 13, 22 through 23. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. All right, so what did we have? Like 30,000 uh, chariots, 6,000 horsemen and people like the, you know, numberless, like the sands of the seashore. And, uh, and then what do we have? Okay, on, on our side, if we're Israel, what do we have? Well, let's see, we have, uh, uh, oh, no one has a sword or spear except for Saul and Jonathan. Okay, uh, now, I don't know if you're a betting person at how you would go right now uh, in this battle, but this isn't looking very good. But they were found with Saul and Jonathan and said, whew, well, at least we have some, you know, a sword and shield, at least two people. Remember, they have 30,000 chariots. They have 6,000 horsemen, and then they have soldiers that, as far as I know, all have sword and shield that are numberless. But they were found with Saul and Jonathan. And I've read that, what, twice, three times now? Let me see if I can move on to the next sentence. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. So in this situation, which, by the way, makes total sense to me why Israel would be fearful, why they would be hiding in pits and holes and caves. And yet, that's natural man thinking. Now, I always put natural man over here. And then supernatural man is over here. Okay, we have two different dimensions to our life. We have a first man, an old man, and we have a new man in Christ. We have flesh and we have spirit. And so when we live after the flesh, it is totally reasonable to be fearful. Because what do you rely on? You're relying on your own ability. What you bring to the table. What do you bring into the table if you're Israel? Well, let's see, we have, let's put all our swords and shields out on the table. Clank, clank. Anyone else? Uh, do we have anything else? Okay, we have two. We have two uh, for, for, an entire, for an entire nation. Okay, that's not good. I could understand after the natural why you would be fearful. However, do you remember the story of Elisha? They had two. He and his servant. I'm not even sure. They could have had coffee in their hands too. I don't even know if they had swords. And they are surrounded by the Syrian army. And yet, a man of God, someone who is positioned here to look at life through a different lens, is not fearful. Elisha is going to just totally bust through all of our excuses for giving way to anxiety and fear. Because he sees something with eyes of faith that this natural realm over here cannot see. All they see is 30,000 chariots. All they see is 6,000 horsemen. All they see is a numberless uh, troop of soldiers. 
with a desire to kill. And yet the man of God, if you're going to play the man, you play it over here. And you see mountains full of horses and chariots of fire all around. And you are convinced that greater are those that are with you than those that are with the Syrian army. And what we're going to see in this story is, again, another symbol of that in the Old Testament, pulling a Jonathan, where he is going to see a greater God than this supposedly impossible to beat throng of Philistines. One man steps out of the 600. 600 against a numberless horde, and they have two weapons, as far as we know. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. Come, let's uh, go pick a fight with the Philistines. Come, you and me. We're going to go and take them on. Could you imagine if you're the armor bearer? Now, here's, here's the way I want you to look at this. I want you to look at Jonathan being a symbol of Christ or a symbol of the Spirit of God. And you have a culture that is surrounding you that is mocking what you stand for mocking your position, saying, you are so weak. The church you are part of is so pathetic. <laughs> oh, you guys actually think you're going to make a difference? Are you going around sharing the gospel and you know, winning all these people to Christ? How many people have you won to Christ this past year? Oh, yeah, you had that one conversation with someone who said they'd think about it, right? <laughs> you see, I got the edge. And we're feeling all small. And yet, imagine the Spirit of God says to you, hey, Let's go out and get them. Now, I understand why, as the armor bearer, you might not be inclined towards hopping up, springing to your feet and saying, let's do this thing. And yet, if you were to think about it, instead of from this vantage point, this vantage point. Remember that greater are those that are with us than those that are with him? I know that Saul is commanding everyone to sort of stay put and to sort of hide. But we can't do that in such a time when earthly leadership is cowed, when earthly leadership is saying, hey, fearfulness is actually what is, you know, in vogue now. We still have to follow heavenly leadership. And the Spirit of God is reaching out his hand saying, let's go do it. Now, this is the tension I want you to sort of freshly feel, because we could easily read stories from the Bible and go, hmm, wow, that's amazing. That, that really is amazing that Jonathan did that. I'm, I'm impressed with Jonathan. I'm also very impressed with the armor bearer. Young man is what he's called. A young man. And look what he does. He doesn't even hesitate. He's like, absolutely. So who is this man willing to follow the fool? Of course, when we look at Jonathan, it's very easy to say he's a fool. And if you didn't know the end of the story, you'd probably conclude he was a fool. If you heard the story of, like, did you hear about what happened? <laughs> you, will, you won't believe this. But, I mean, there's like 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, numberless troops, and Israel has nothing. Okay, you can put a different name other than Israel, so it feels like a modern story, right? And, you know, they have no weapons or anything. And then one of these guys actually gets up and thinks he's going to change everything, right? And goes out to pick a fight with them. I mean, it would be ridiculous if you didn't know the end of the story. We just happen to know the end of the story, so we're like, oh, it was very wise. It was a very wise maneuver on Jonathan's part. It doesn't look wise. And that's a key thing for you to recognize, is the fearlessness that God has called you to in the world's economy doesn't always look wise. So who is this man? So his armor bearer said to him, I want you to see if this is the quote of your soul. Do all that is in your heart, go then. Here I am with you according to your heart. Imagine responding to the Spirit of God that way. You see, why, why don't we? Because we all esteem the response. We all deem it correct. We all know that this is what God would want of us. So why isn't it the present tense reality in our soul? It's because there is something that is blocking the way. It is something known as cowardice. And cowardice is something that doesn't just linger in one of you in this room. It is something that is a very familiar sensation to many, if not every single one of us in this room. Now, we all have different gradients. If we were to go around the room, we could definitely pick out some people that have, have a strength in the area of courage and boldness in this room. 
And then there'd be others in here where like, and I would not be one that is chosen. That would be how you would think about yourself because you're very familiar with the terrain of your own soul when it comes to that moment when the Spirit of God says, hey, let's go over and share, this, uh, share with this person about Jesus. And we don't feel like that, that armor bearer. We esteem the armor bearer and we want what the armor bearer has, but we feel like we have a, we've been shortchanged somehow in our spiritual life that we didn't get the right personality or we didn't get whatever that native boldness is that some people have. You know, some people do. They pop out of the womb and they're just social. You ever notice that? And they just come up and they want to meet everyone. They want to hug everyone. And you're like, what is, what's going on with that kid? And then the parents are like, yeah, they just, they just love people. And so it can translate as if it's a personality thing. Instead of, listen closely, instead of a spiritual thing. You see, every single one of us will play the coward when it comes to a culture and the truth of Jesus, if we don't have power. There is something, it's, it's different. Like for instance, if I'm in, uh, it used to be the uh, Oakland Raiders. What are the Raiders, where do, they, where do they play now? Are they still in Oakland? Do they go back to Oakland? They were in LA for a while. I don't even know, I haven't followed football in a while. Vegas? <laughs> See, someone's going to be listening to this going, he doesn't know that they're in Vegas. That shows you, hey, Eric's been doing really well in, in not following football. If he doesn't know, Vegas. <laughs> the Vegas uh, Raiders? Is that what they're called? That is just weird sounding to my ears. All right. So it used to be, you know, when Oakland, the Oakland Raiders, it was like just sort of this dark, mean town. And, you know, everyone just sort of was mean in Oakland. And the Broncos, you know, would go and play there and they'd throw trash at them and it was just rude. You know, it'd sort of be like Eric Ludy showing up at a, in an Oakland Raiders game. I know, they're called the Vegas Raiders now. But showing up at an Oakland Raiders game in Oakland, right? And then shouting, go Broncos! And you could say, you wouldn't want to do that. I know, but do you know that to do that is 1,000 times easier than just going out here to the corner and saying, follow Jesus. It's because the first doesn't have a spiritual content to it. It's hard to do when you're in foreign territory that they might throw a piece of trash at you, might make fun of you, but it's a whole different thing when you identify with Jesus Christ. It's spiritual. And when you try and make it just an issue of natural boldness, natural courage, natural moxie, you're missing the point in representing the king of the universe. He's like, I want you to represent me, but you need to know something right up front. You can't do it without me. It's like, God, but I'm a good communicator. I have natural personality for boldness. I like people. I care about them. That's wonderful. I'm glad you're packaged that way. However, you're going to need something supernatural to be able to do this, which also helps some of you that have been really struggling doing it. Because you're leaning in your own strength. You're reaching into your own pockets going, but God, I don't have anything here that's enabling me to do it. And God's like, oh, that's a shocker. I didn't know that. He knows you don't have it, which is why he has given you power. But if you think that what you have is enough or the cultivation of what you have is how it works, you're missing out on how to play the man. So Brian, uh, this is just a name, you know, because I'm going to give our armor bearer a name, and his name is Brian, okay? Because you were always wondering, what's his name? His name's Brian. Could you imagine a guy in ancient Israel named Brian? Doesn't that just sound funny? So the name, and I, I think it's great. It's almost like his name means the man. I mean, look at this, strong, virtuous, and honorable. That's a great name. There's going to be a whole breakout of people, young kids named Brian now after this message. So Brian the armor bearer, I know it sounds a little funny, uh, but what is his secret? Because we can esteem the movements of grace inside this armor bearer. We recognize that we lack something that he has. His response is so perfect. It is so noble. It is so honorable. It is so strong. Why don't we have that? Have you ever heard the, the term take courage? It's an interesting phrase that we don't really think about uh, at any deep level. It's just sort of there. It's, it's in our, 
in our language, in our cultural understanding that someone's taking courage. And yet it's an interesting phrase to take courage. It's not to dig in your pockets and find courage, but to take courage. It's actually a very interesting uh, way of saying it. That's what the armor bearer is going to do. So who's that armor bearer? Brian, the armor bearer. He's the guy that believes the word and takes courage. Now let me go back in time a few days because I think it was Thursday morning this last week we had a message called Reckoning with Truth and I called Brian up. So this is a different Brian, not Brian the armor bearer from our story, even though it's strange that they have the same name, isn't it? Uh, but this is Brian from our class and I came up and I, told, I informed Brian that he had a problem. Uh, it was very embarrassing for him in front of everyone. Uh, but I said, you know, outside those double doors in this chapel, you know, is two-ton Tony. We, we described two-ton Tony. It's a symbol of the flesh, that which controls us, the power of sin. And he demanded $9 uh, from Brian. And Brian didn't have any money in his pockets. And I, oh, it's just terrible. Because you know what two-ton Tony's going to do if Brian can't pay up? He's going to beat him up, rough him up. I mean, he's lost ears. He's lost pinkies. I think he lost a right nostril once because of this. <laughs> So his life has been massively uh, challenged because of his lack, because of his inability to overcome that which controls him. And so then this is, this is important for you guys all to hear, okay? As Brian was standing up here, I became symbolic of like the gospel of Jesus Christ, of, of the message of truth. And I said, Brian, I've seen your need and I've made provision for you. And in the back room, across the, the hall from the girls' bathroom, on a chair, underneath a notebook, is a $10 bill. Now, how much does he need? He needs nine. And I just told him he has $10. Now, it's not something that he has in his fingers where he can make the crinkly sound and hear it with his own natural ears, but he received a promise. Now, depending on if he trusts me, that's a huge aspect of it. Like, if he didn't, if I was a con man, then he might be like, oh, thank you. Yeah, great. It's great to hear that I have $10, you know. But what if the one speaking to him, now remember, I was symbolic of God. I'm not God. But what if the one speaking to him could not lie and was completely trustworthy and would never change, which means what he speaks is good and you can take it to the bank? Well, it was interesting because I asked Brian a question. I said, Brian, do you have what you need in your own pockets to be able to face two-ton Tony outside? He said, no. Then I said, but Brian, do you have what you need? I mean, it sounds like the same question, doesn't it? But his answer was yes. Whoa, I just said, Brian, do you have in your own pockets that what you need to, to face two-ton Tony? He says, no. But then when I say, do you have what you need? He says, yes. How could he say yes? Because he had it. I said, how do you have it? He goes, by faith. I said, faith in what? Your word. You see, when God's word speaks to us and we believe it, we actually gain something. And no longer do we fear to ton Tony if we have just, what the Bible calls, reckoned ourselves $10 richer. If we have actually received $10, why would we fear a $9 test? You can answer that for me. And yet I've just described your entire life right there. God says, I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. Yeah, you know that test? You know that challenge up ahead? I have supplied you everything you need for it. So where does fear fit in, guys? Where does anxiety fit in? What does anxiety declare? I don't know that I'll have enough. I don't think I have enough. I feel weak. I feel like I am insufficient. That what I have and what I possess is not going to match the demand. Who told you that? Because the word of God says the exact opposite, which is why fear and anxiety has zero place in the kingdom life. You see, if we live according to natural man, then all we have is what is in our pockets. All we have is what we can derive. And Brian has Zippo. Well, he has some lint in there. But he does not have that which he needs to be able to pass the tests of his life. And yet, when you transfer to the kingdom of heaven by faith, you now have access to something known as courage. Every bit of courage you will ever need for any challenge that the hand of Jonathan will ever reach down and say, come with me. Are you ready to do this thing? And when we take courage in that moment, not from our own pockets, but from the kingdom treasury, do you have it in your own pockets, that which is needed, 
to be able to face the challenges of a dreadful world around us? No. But do you have that which you need? Yes. How do you have that which you need? By faith. Faith in what? His word. And that's how you take courage. So there's a story that I, I've repeated to myself for many years, and I don't know how many times I've shared it in a sermon. It's always sort of awkward because my mom's name is Barb. And so when I found out that this key role of an older man in the Waldensian culture is a Barb, this feels sort of weird because my mom's Barb, right? And, but a Barb in the Waldensian culture, the Waldensians are this ancient people group that during the, the Dark Ages, they actually had the word of God in text and they would hand transcribe it. But they were highly illegal in doing it because the Roman Catholic Church had sort of gone bad at this time and they were killing anyone that would dare uh, mishandle what they felt was their trust. And so the Waldensians would go into villages as merchants and they would, spe they would sell their goods and then if they sensed that the situation was right, they would risk their life and they would talk about something else that they possessed called the pearl of great price. And if the person was interested, they would then share Jesus with them. And many of these Waldensian missionaries were brutally killed because of this. And yet they kept going, kept going, kept going. And so I want you just to be a young man in the Waldensian culture. And I know the, the ladies, that's sort of hard to imagine probably. But you're a young man, and just imagine that you're being groomed on the word of God and the truth, just like you have been, right? And yet, you live in a very volatile, very dangerous world. And if you just kept the word of God for yourself in the Italian Alps, and just sort of hid in your cave, you'd be fine. But God's word was not meant to be hidden. It was meant to be shared. Ah, this, this is where the rub comes in. Because you know you have to take this truth into the villages. Oh, but that's where the risk is. And so what they did is they had a Barb. I know this really sounds strange. Maybe it doesn't sound strange to you because your mom's name isn't Barb. But when your mom's name is Barb, it's really strange to say, and they had a Barb. You know, I picture my mom right there. <laughs> However, they had this older man who was a seasoned veteran, a father of the faith. And they would match up a young man with a father of the faith. And the father of the faith would say, Come on, buddy, I remember what it was like, and I know how terrifying it can seem, but I wanna show you how it works. And so they would come to the edge of the town. And you can, I mean, I can, I, this is the reason I've thought about this story so many times is because when I was young, I was praying for, I know it sounds strange, but for a barb. And I could almost see one of you going, God's already given you a barb. And I, I know, I know, I know, but like that, an old man that, understands the calling on my life that can reach down, take my hand, and pull me into the village. Because what many of us have lacked in our life is that. We, we find ourselves at the edge of the village going, I know I'm supposed to go in, but I don't know how to, let me just put it this way, take courage. See, that older man knows how to take courage. He's been doing it for decades of his life. And so what he oftentimes would do is literally take the young man's hand and pull him along. And his confidence was transferred. His faith was transferred to the young man. And the young man, as he began to walk, and as they entered homes, and as the old man began to share, the young man began to gain a strength. But this is something we have not been around. We have not been around that older generation that grabs our hand and takes us across the threshold of obedience. So I'm going to say taking courage is the same or equals the same thing as reckoning courage. Now that makes probably a lot more sense to our students this week than maybe to someone that's just visiting because we spent a good time talking about reckoning. Reckoning is the word that Paul uses in Romans 6 to describe how we get kingdom things into our life. And it's an accounting term. And what you see Brian doing when I say to him, I've given you $10, and uh, it's back in that back room on the other side of where the girl's uh, bathroom is, you know, under, on a chair underneath a, a, a notebook. You see, what he is doing is he's doing some accounting work. He's going to reckon himself $10 richer. And then I, and the next thing I said is, can you show me this $10? He said, no. I said, well, then how do you know you have it? 
because he has it by faith, and that faith is a confidence in my word. And if, let's switch it to God's word, let's say if God's word is trustworthy to you, then don't you think it's reasonable that you should believe that it's going to be there if he says there's a chair with a notebook on it, a $10 bill underneath it? I think it's totally reasonable to take God at his word. And as a result, Brian, even before he gets the crinkle of the $10 between his fingers, can rejoice, knowing that everything he needs to pass his test in life has been entrusted to him. So my question for you is, do you know that? You see, the word of God wants to come to you and convince you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. No weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. Fear not, little flock, says our God. He says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. He says, if God be for you, who can stand against you? Now, those aren't just poetic words. That's the truth that is meant to be reckoned. You're supposed to take it to your account. And just as Brian suddenly could answer the questions completely different, let me ask you the questions. Do you have in your own pockets that which is needed to face a world that hates you, to speak boldly in a world that wants you to shut up? Do you have this in your own pockets? No. But do you have it? How do you have it? By faith in his word. And this is the transaction of the soul. This is what makes an armor bearer. This is what makes an Elisha. This is what makes a Christian. This is what causes us to play the man. So taking courage equals reckoning courage. And here's just the way of saying it. Don't measure your ability based on your feelings right now. When you get into a situation and you have a, a it's an it's a obedience situation. What do you have a tendency to do? You feel, you feel a lot of things and you feel very weak. You ever felt that where your knees are knocking and you just feel like your tongue is turned into a felt eraser in your mouth and you can hardly even get your brain going. If you go based on emotions in that situation, you're not gonna be able to move forward. You have to go based on something greater than emotion. So you're supposed to measure it based on his promise to go before you and to supply you everything you need to triumph in the dangerous task. So there's all sorts of different dangerous tasks that could be in front of us. There's the difficult task, the unpleasant task. You guys know the difference between all. The, each of these has a different sort of face to it. The awkward task, the risky task, the painful task, the challenging task. There's all sorts of different things where we stop at the threshold. And we're like, God, I, I, can't, I just don't have it. This, I'm just not made for this. I, I don't have that you know, thing that this guy over here seems to have, where he just loves to leap over that line and do crazy things. But I didn't get that gene. And so as a result, when you get to that line of courage, that line of obedience, you halt and you come up with excuses and reasons why moving forward would be you know, unwise or unnecessary. But God built you for the difficult task. He built you to cross it. However, he knows that in and of yourself, you do not have the moxie, the guts, the determination, the grit, which is why he has given you himself. He has given you everything you need for life and godliness, or as we could translate that, He's given you everything you need for the difficult task. Kakapatheo, sort of a fun word to say. It means to endure hardness, to walk through challenge, to face crisis, to carry difficulty. If we could summarize it for this message, it's to cross the line. That dangerous line, that difficult line, that awkward line, that painful line. When you know the Spirit of God is reaching out his hand, just like Jonathan saying, hey, let's go fight the Philistines. Just as you're sensing in this generation right now where there is a cowing effect, a fearing effect, where the enemy's trying to get you to go silent. He's trying to cow you into uh, subservience to him. It's like, hey, you know, your reputation is shot. You'll lose your job. You'll lose all comforts in this life. You really want the system against you. 
I don't, I don't want the system against me. By the way, hint, I should say historic hint, the system has always been about against Christianity, true Christianity. So you might as well just accept it instead of fight it and wait for America to finally become some godly nation before you get your Christian game on. This is when we are proven believers, right now. Not in the time of ease, in the time of challenge. So, kakapatheo. So, this word is going to be, I mean, oftentimes translated as endure hardness, right? But Paul is going to challenge and exhort, command Timothy to kakapatheo, to endure hardness, to walk across that line. And he gives the illustration as a good soldier in Jesus Christ. It's an interesting phrase to liken it to what a soldier must do. You see, a soldier, if, if you've ever studied war, which for whatever reason I seem to spend an undue amount of time doing that, but there is, there's one moment and where you have to make a choice, and it's called something different throughout the ages. You know, and when, it's at a, when you're in the trench in World War I and World War II, it's called going over the top. And where your commander says, it's your time to go. You know what that means? You're going to have to climb out of your trench where there's like artillery fire, there's machine gun fire exploding in your direction, and there's a space in between you and the the enemy trench, and it's called no man's land, and it's divided by barbed wire. It's your time to go over the top. All right? Cacopatheo as a good soldier. And you know how hard that is to actually get your body to move, to actually and that, that's without God at all. And men have done this throughout the ages, okay? Physical gunfire is challenging. Spiritual gunfire, even more so. There is something about our souls that has such a trepidation about the opinion of men, about what could happen in our life. We don't want to lose the grip on our comforts. We don't want to lose the grip on our dreams and desires. We really want to hold on to this. And Jesus says, I need you to lay it down now. If you're going to be a good soldier, I need you to charge. But to get out of that trench and go over the top into no man's land, I mean, you could just use your imagination. This isn't a wise thing to do. But if your commander has asked you to, let's go and t- pick a fight with some Philistines. Let's go over the top, armor bear. <laughs> I made a loud noise. I, I need to make my noises go out this side of my mouth instead of this side. How does a good soldier function? A short list of good soldier actions during hardness. Okay, this is just historic romance of war type of answer to that. They smile at difficulty. They embrace challenge. They laugh at impossibilities. They sing amidst the falling artillery shells. They sleep in the mud hole like a, a prince in his royal bed. And that's not easy to do, by the way. This isn't natural man stuff. Uh, by the way, uh, the, there was a study done, I think it was World War I, on who were the most uh, soldier-like uh, nations, like who produced the most of this. The Australians were first. I want to say New Zealand, Canada, and then America. We were like fourth in that stink. However, what made the Australians win the, uh, win the competition? Because when they got into situations that were impossible, they would laugh. They would smile. They would smirk. They had like this sense of humor that went with it. It's like if we could bottle that up, take what the Australians had in battle, and stick it in our souls as Christians, could you imagine every time a bomb goes off in your life, you get a smirk on your face? It's the first reaction. It's like, oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. I love how God does these things. I love going through battle. You know, there's certain men in history that love going to battle. Like, what in the world is wrong with them? You know, whatever they have, we need. Because when you dread going to battle, you're going to dread your entire Christian life. But when you can finally smile at it and say, this is the dream life, which is what some of them think. It's like, oh, I don't want this war to end. Who would ever think that? And yet it's because they have found something in the midst of it. They found a camaraderie with their, the fellow troops. They found an enjoyment in the challenge of it all. So let's look at what the Bible says a good soldier does. So this is just straight out of the text. 
They stand fast. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.15. They hold fast. Hebrews 3.6. They stand firm. Ephesians 6.14. They're brave. 1 Corinthians 16.13. They're bold. Ephesians 3.12. They're courageous. Joshua 1.7. They don't shrink back. Hebrews 10.39. They don't grow weary. Galatians 6.9. They keep going. 2 Thessalonians 3.13, they keep moving, Hebrews 12.13. They persevere, Revelation 3.10. They endure, 2 Timothy 2.12. They rejoice, Philippians 4.4, and they leap for joy, or they give a fist pump of joy, Luke 6.23. Giving a fist pump of joy sounds more soldierly, doesn't it, than, than like a leap? You think that's a little delicate. Pulling a G.I. Joe. So what have we had? We had pulling a Ludi, we had pulling a Brent, we had pulling a Jonathan, we had pulling a Brian, the armor bearer, uh, and now we have pulling a G.I. Joe. That fits sort of the soldier theme, don't you think? Uh, there's a character in the Bible. You, you do know there's a character in the Bible named G.I. Joe, don't you? Uh, I'll, I'll introduce you to him. So what does G.I. Joe do? He takes courage. Here it is, Mark 15, our G.I. Joe passage. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before Sabbath, G.I. Joe, or I mean Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. I think I told the students this week that I was reading through and I got stirred by Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah, and he made it into my message too. What did he do? He pulled a Brian. He pulled a Jonathan. He reckoned himself wealthy. He took something when he needed it most. This is a terrifying moment. Jesus has just died on the cross. I mean, there wasn't a lot of positive opinion about Jesus here. And so to identify with Jesus and to go after his body, I mean, what a, what a dangerous thing to do. So he took courage. I want you guys to recognize that every bit of courage that you need is made available to you. You keep examining your pockets and you keep saying to yourself, I don't have it. And I'm here to tell you, you do have it. Uh, fact, faith, and experience. What if, you experience. what if your experience is cowardice? Now, there's a story of three characters. I, the reason uh, I, there's even some chuckling here is I think I've shared this story, what, four times this week? Five? Five times this week. Okay, so we're going to make it six. Unless you call Sunday the start of a new week, this is the first time. I've only shared it once this week so far, right? <laughs> so there are three characters, and they're all commissioned to walk a ridgepole of a barn. And that, that ridgepole, I know that sounds easy to you in your mind, but this is like a razor's edge, and it's impossible. First character gets out, and his name is Fact. So it's Fact, Faith, and Experience. Fact comes out, and he just does it. He walks it. I mean, I thought it was supposed to be impossible. It is but fact is, you know, in Christianity, we don't call it fact, we call it truth. And technically, the truth is Jesus. And so Jesus is going to come down to this earth, and he is going to live a life that is impossible. No man has ever been able to do it until Jesus came. And he's going to pull it off. Faith is where you and I come into the story. Faith, when he fixes his gaze, or she fixes her gaze on the facts, faith gains balance and begins to pull off the impossible. This is when everyone begins to wonder if my definition of impossible uh, is actually correct. It's sort of like I'm saying, inconceivable. And then someone's like, I don't, th you keep using that word, but I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> impossible, faith is able to do the impossible because it fixes its gaze on the fact. And life would be all sweet and charming if that was the only two characters that existed, but there's another character. And his name is experience. It could be called emotion. And there's a lot going on back here. And emotion and experience are reaching out and grabbing the shirt sleeve of faith, saying, hey, but what about this? And it always has a, as a plea. And when it comes to things like something dangerous in front of us, what do you think experience is going to say? We're cowards. We've always been cowards. What do you think? That you're going to change that overnight? As if you're some bold, courageous character now? That's not you. You see, you have a voice behind you, which is your experience, which is telling you that this isn't your personality, that it's not for you to do things like this. You're, you're sheepish, you're quiet, you're introverted, whatever the term is that has been officially tagged on you that causes you to stop short of moving forward and following fact. The key 
for walking the ridgepole and even getting your experience and your emotion to begin to line up and live the impossible life is you have to ignore them. Experience and emotion have no voice in your life. Your job is to follow the facts. God is reaching out his hand saying, come follow me. And your job is to reach into the treasury of heaven and grab courage. You're supposed to take courage for the journey, not from your own pockets. Don't look back and say, but I've never had it. Boldly enter the throne room of grace where you may obtain mercy and grace for help in time of need. So if you ever have a time of need, which by the way is a big, a big portion of the Christian life is a time of need, you have access to the throne of grace and there's so much courage in there. There's so much boldness. There's so much power and it's unlimited in its measure. You have been supplied everything you need in abundance to be able to move forward and play the man. Reckoning or taking his courage as your own. So here's our finishing scripture, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, it even has sort of a closing sort of remark sound to it. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's not be strong in what you have right now in your own pockets. What, what do you have? Dig in your own pockets and let's see. Let's, let's put it all out of the table, clank, clank. We have a sword and a spear. And it's like, I don't think we're going to be able to do this, guys. If we were to look at it, we would look just like Israel back in that day. And our enemy looks so much more powerful than us. But what if we were to say, hey, guys, it's not what's in our pockets. What's in God's pockets? Let's get the scriptures out on the table. And it's not just clang, clang. It's clang, 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 clang. You know, the whole table falls over. It cannot even sustain, support such strength of argument. Our God has gone before us and made a way. And he has supplied us with everything we need for obedience, for courage, for standing strong, for speaking out, for doing that which is right for life, for godliness. However, our secret is that we must be like the armor bearer named Brian. We must be like G.I. Joe. And we must take courage. Our king is looking for a few good men, women, to follow him into this battle. And he is ready to supply us with all our armor, and with all our inner fortitude, he's not leaning on your natural man's strength. You didn't think he was. He's going to use your personality, but he's going to fill that personality with his power. He has a plan. Let's allow him to do it. Father, we don't have it in our own strength. We don't have it in our pockets, but we have it. We have it by faith in Christ. And Lord Jesus, I pray that every single person here would get this message, that they would grip it, that it wouldn't just flutter over their head or go in one ear and out the other, but that they would somehow get it and that they would know how to take the courage for their own life that you have supplied. Lord, we love you and we trust you. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray this, amen.